It's the Trucking for Millennials podcast. This is like our bicentennial. It it Fire is that truck up. I like it. I like it. Yes, episode two hundred, dude. I don't know if I'm using that term in the right way. But... You remember bicentennial, man? Oh yeah, was that with Tom Hanks? Or no, not uh, Robin Williams. Robin Williams. Yeah, he was like a robot that. or whatever from the future. Oh man, uh, he. You know, you make that you make that uh movie again. I I don't even really remember the movie very much. Just that he was like a robot or something. Mm. But like. I imagine he'd probably be a truck driver now. Yeah, I think like he wanted it. They wanted to bring him to life. I think that at the end of the movie, like he something happens or something. Spoiler alert. Or maybe 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 he does come to life and he's like a butler for the family for like years or something. What? I, I don't know. I'm like having flashbacks now. I'm, I'm like remembering this movie. I'm gonna have to watch it. Um, you know that that's when they could remake now with all the AI and robots yeah. and everything you see on Instagram. Exactly. Exactly. We got a, a great show for you, uh, man. International truck uh, road check, cvsa.org. International road check. If you're a truck driver, it's an important date to keep in mind, and that's uh, the show today. Uh, we've got a DOT compliance officer that we're going to chat to because uh, he's going to know what to what to equip you with. So you are ready and uh, road ready for this thing. So it's dude. Amazing. By the end of this episode, they're going to be saying, "Pull me over, pull me over." <laughs> exactly. I need that clean inspection. Absolutely. International road check is May 16th through the 18th. So uh, put it on your calendar if it isn't already, and if it's not already, you might need to uh, think about what you're up to. So uh, it's got an emphasis on ABS and cargo securement. But first, yeah. So that this is show 200, and I'll get into that in a second. But also, the next show is show 201. Yeah. So next week is not. Uh, it's going to be the safety check, but also following week you want to check out the podcast. You got some. You got something up your sleeve for that one, don't you? Yes, for months. Uh, actually, like for the last month, I've been trying to make something special for uh, this this uh, this program, Trucking for Millennials podcast. Dude, it's been 200 episodes. It's pretty awesome. It is cool. And, uh, you know, without a without skipping a beat. And uh, so next week, uh, be sure to tune in on Monday. Uh, we're going to have uh, two guests, uh, one from the side of the aisle advocating for electrification of trucks, uh, pro, you know, the environment, mm -hmm. you know, alternative fuels, all that kind of stuff. Uh, they're she, she, Nikki Oakcook. Uh, I might be butchering the name right now. I have practiced enough, but um, she's advocating for for that and um, putting the wheels in motion, uh, so to speak, for making that a reality mm -hmm. for the future of trucking. And so we're going to have a former guest, David Heller of the TCA Trucker Carrier Association, on the show as well with her because it just kind of worked out where they both wanted to come and talk about electrification of trucks, but they had two absolutely different point of views. Uh, David saying, man, this is not practical. It's not cost effective. The infrastructure is not there. And then Nikki's pulling the other way and saying, we got to have this now and, and quick and in a hurry. And so we're going to have them both on to have a great friendly conversation. Maybe not a debate, maybe a little debate, maybe a little uh, uh, you know, professional conversation about, mm -hmm. man, what's the real, what's actually happening and what's, where's the middle ground maybe that we can find. So, uh, definitely tune into that. It's going to be a fun episode and, uh, I am sure we're going to have, uh, some great conversation. Cool. Well, get questions in for that. You know, if you have a question for, it, it has anything to do, it sounds like the infrastructure, yeah. the type of trucks, what 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 that's going to look like in our future. I think for both people, that would be a, a great question. Yeah. You know, one of the ones that we've we've talked about on the show is like, what's a level one? What's a level two? What's level three automation? Right. And a lot of times automation and electrification, those two get, mm -hmm. get mixed together. But we really invite all those questions. Uh, yeah. We're going to have experts on here that can answer this yeah yeah and maybe not even questions just opinions would be great whatever Ooh, your opinion love is the opinions. Be, yeah we love the strong people in the trucking industry aren't opinionated are they Aaron? <laughs> you know it just depends on who you ask so mm. uh we're asking you please uh just hit us up podcast at pdqamerica.com um uh, that's an email you can uh send in your questions and opinions and leading up to that show uh and uh at pdq america as far as socials go or linkedin whichever yeah so i just i like i was just like what's some significant things about the number 200 this is the number 200 episodes okay, so okay just had a, a few things so it says in 1920 1927 henry seagrave became the first person to drive a car 
uh, over a kilometer course at an average speed greater than 200 miles per hour. Okay. Blind and driving 200 miles an hour. That's pretty cool. Blind? Yeah. Yeah. Became the first person to drive a car over a kilo kilometer course at an average speed. Yeah. No, no, he wasn't blind. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. it's still a great fact yeah, yeah. But i mean now i'm like well it, it's great it's great <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome anyways that's not safe the next one <laughs> no, dude, in, don't drive. in 2014 mike newman 52 became the first blind man to drive a car at a speed over 200 miles an hour he was guided by a navigator over a radio link oh okay so, okay the next one the next one the first one the, the not blind on the first one but in the second one yes so yeah. and, he, and he used a I, radio link i guess that guy heard about the first guy's record and said watch this yeah watch this <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I did. It does not what I meant. Oh my gosh! Trucking for millennials. We're on brand. Oh man! According to the Belfast Zoo, there are only two hundred giant anteaters living in zoos around the world. Oh wow! Okay, it, we have some at Caldwell Zoo. There are only about two hundred white tigers in the world. Okay. In the two in the year two hundred A.D., Clement of Alexandria denounced the use of musical instruments to accompany human voices in Christian churches. Oh. Hmm, that's interesting that's changed in 200 bc the building of the great wall of china began okay and the 200th episode of south park which is transmitted in 2010 was titled 200 okay is that what you're going to call this show here? maybe no we, we got a better you can probably do better than 200. the great wall of each side of the main square in Krakow, poland is 200 meters long shout out to poland right right yeah friend of the show paul shout out to paul break caviar and then number episode. 10 not the not counting the numbers of the 10 items this set of oh yeah this article had 200 words in it cheesy <laughs> anyways <laughs> anyways 200 200th episode dude i Aaron, like the, it's been fun i like the fast facts dude that was great a little awkward as usual like you said on brand yeah awesome so All watch right. this yeah <laughs> oh boy all right so let's bring on rob we'll talk about international road tech do clients getting you safe ready for the road health and safety is always top priority rob welcome to the show sir thanks for having me yes sir so rob uh according to your linkedin uh you're a risk control and operations consultant optimizing business operations by analyzing and advising on compliance risk management fire and life safety osha interstate fmcsa transportation related in entities insurance carriers all this kind of stuff anything you want to add no it's a mouthful in it <laughs> yeah it sounds like do it. um so yeah. essentially dumbing all that down we just do a lot you know i started as a truck driver a long time ago wanted to learn more about the whole industry not just one piece of it but really i wanted to start as that truck driver to kind of get the practical piece and now um uh, you know i own a fleet done maintenance management executive and enterprise carriers and now i just do risk um risk exposure compliance and i do a lot of work for gallagher bassett and some other companies just for insurance risk control so that's that's where we are now awesome and you spent some time with brokerage too right for our brokerage friends listening yeah after i left um i went from driver uh to the world that i actually learned to hate as a driver which was brokering and uh, started working for a friend of mine that had a blue grace deal in Virginia. And um, he just threw me in, said, hey, 100 phone calls a day. Whatever you do, just make 100 phone calls. And that's how we got started. So learned the business there and then ended up buying a carrier, running some carriers. And here we are doing risk. Let, let me ask you this just before we were like really dive in. How yep. was that transition for you going from, uh, you know, like it's kind of like joining the dark side a little bit. You probably like kind of yeah. watch your uh your, your your side mirrors when you parked it the first time because like me and my truck buddies i don't want them to know and then also like going from the cab to an office like what was that transition like going from i'm gonna i'm gonna do you know hundreds of miles a day to hundreds of phone calls a week uh how was that transition it was it was significant because you're going from one you're being you're typically all by yourself right in a truck cab i mean all day, all night. I mean, you might not see anybody until you see a shipper. That's probably not very nice and you don't want to talk to them anyway. So then you're going to an office environment where you're making cold calls to people or warm calls and you're trying to figure out what to say because you haven't seen people in two years. Um, so it was a transition, you know, and you had to, you had to figure out how to deal with people, how to communicate with people again. It was kind of like 
you might as well have said you were in prison, right? I mean, you're going from like not talking to anybody at all or seeing terrible people. And then you're going to brokers trying to convince people to let you haul their freight or find carriers to haul the freight. So it was serious transition. Yeah. I can only imagine. What, was there anything that like came like, like that made it easier for you? Like, was there any like thing you leaned on that you'd give as advice to others that have made that transition? Well, I, I, I didn't start, you know, I started my transportation life as a trucker, but before that I was in restaurants. And even then I worked in the back of the house cause I couldn't work in the front. I just, the people thing just turned me off. So it was, I had a, I had a history of kind of learning various things. And I grew up on a farm where, you know, today we might be doing milk tomorrow. We might be doing eggs tomorrow. We might be cutting asparagus. So, you know, I, I typically just roll with it. You know, it's, you, you're always going to be learning something new. Even now, you know, I still take, I still take a lot of classes and, and learn all kinds of different things. So, so that that's just how I've done it. Take the punches as they come and do what you got to do. Yeah, I yeah like that's it. cool because you know that's a that's a transition we've seen take place in our office mm -hmm. a, a couple of times now is is guys that were driving truck have now came in and they're helping us out in our freight brokerage and I I love the experience that they bring because you know you you have some individuals in our office it's just like any other brokerage that this is their first job or second or third job and they don't know what it's like to be out over the road and you know they're over here well this is an easy load and I, I've told people I'll never tell a truck driver it's an easy load right. Well, you're sitting at a computer. It's it's tough to say you telling someone it's an easy load, yeah. um, right? But but I think that just being able to uh, have all that, like those people in a room together and being able to lean on each other's advice, like I always love to hear what the opinion of the person that was in the truck before has on the subject. And like, hey, how should we treat the the or what should we do in this situation? You know, how should we handle this one? Or, you know, there's so many different personalities and things. So it's, it's great to bring, be able to bring truck drivers into the mix whenever you're doing that. Yeah. And you're familiar too. you know, you're, you're coming from, the, from a cab of a truck. So you're familiar mm -hmm. somewhat, at least with hours of service, whether you complied with them as a driver or not, you know what they are. <laughs> um, so, you know, Hey, I can't, this guy can't get from, from Maine to California by tomorrow. So, the, you know, you, you can manage your expectations as a broker better because you understand what that trucker is going to have to deal with, whether it's traffic or hours of service regulations or mm -hmm. roadside inspections. So there's, there's things that you're going to consider and, and you know, understand more than the, than the common fresh start broker. So That's that right. helped a lot. Yeah. Awesome. So Rob, um, uh, okay. So maybe I'll just kind of frame it up for, or you can kind of frame it up. Uh, the international road check. I mean, it happens every year. Uh, it typically happens at this time of year. It's like, you know, the second week of May, third week of May, just kind of depends. Um, but they always set the date with uh, ample amount of time to get ready. And uh, they always have an emphasis on, you know, something. So um, that I, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to stop there and then leave it up to you to kind of frame it up for maybe the the people who maybe it's, this is their first international road check. Mm -hmm. Maybe they just started. Or maybe they know it comes around every time and they're like, man, I never get this. You know, they, they, I never get checked. You know, so like how would you introduce the international road check to truck drivers, trucking companies? Well, it's it's a three day blitz is the words that they like to use. Um, and, and I don't ever really count on the date. A lot of people stick to that. Hey, it's going to be the 16th to the 18th. But even as a truck driver, I never found that I had this huge increase in those three days it was just it sometimes it would happen the following week or two weeks down the road where the port of virginia or wherever we were just got bombarded by dot people and i'm like i thought this was supposed to be two weeks ago so i think a lot of times it's that it's that psychological effect they give you the date so you're counting on it and then a week later or two weeks later they hit you with this but that's just rob's thoughts on it that's not necessarily what they do but Every year they kind of have an emphasis and this year's emphasis is cargo securement and ABS. That doesn't mean they're not going to focus on, you know, your med card and your driver license or credentials when they pull you over your ELDs and your hours of service compliance. They're going to check a lot of different things or you have the potential for them to check a lot of different things. But that's their emphasis items this year. So um, I don't know. I just always have looked at it two different ways. You have a preventability aspect to it. Like, how can you prevent getting pulled over at a roadside? And I always think that's easier than combating the actual roadside and from a survivability aspect. You know, I just think that preventing it 
and avoiding drawing attention to yourself and uh, is easier than surviving it. So that's that's typically how I throw it out there. Focus on preventability, but make sure that if you can't prevent it and they grab you anyway, you're going to be able to survive it. So that's the two big things. And obviously it goes down a long rabbit trail in different directions after that. But that's usually my that's my pitch usually. Got it. So what uh, I appreciate you sharing that you're going to be on the show on LinkedIn. Uh, and you, you touched on that, that preventability aspect, by uh, showcasing a, a truck. I think there were, it's like show motion or something like that. They're a trucking company that they, they, uh, are responsible for entertainment, um, uh, like venues and stuff. So I think they were doing like Taylor Swift concert loads and like, you know, doing that, uh, uh, all, all the all the loads that that she needs to get her stage set up and stuff. So, uh, but you you touched on like them as a as, as a great example of preventability. So, uh, take us into that a little bit of, of what that actually means. So I can take it all the way back to when I first started driving trucks. You know, when you first start driving, everybody wants two years of experience, which no one's going to have because you just started driving. So a lot of times, what you end up doing is you take those trash that trash stuff. And sometimes it's typical trash. It's literally trash. So where I had to take my first job was trash for a company. I'm not going to tell you who they were, but it was a trash company and everything that I drove. It was, it was not good. It was not well-maintained. It was never clean. It had fluid leaking from everywhere. Sometimes the light wouldn't work. One day the front tire actually came off completely lost the steer tire because the studs just sheared off from, from tire wobble. So it was a disaster. I was put out. Of, I, I think when I left there, I had a PSP that was like four pages long. So it had an effect on me at finding a job after that. But those types of things, you're drawing attention to yourself to DOT. And if DOT sees that trash truck coming down the road where the tires wobbling, getting ready to come off, you're ugly. You're not taking care of your equipment. It's saying, hey, come look at me, because if you're not taking care of the stuff that's apparent, that you can see just driving by that DOT compliance officer. It's like, if that, if they don't care about the apparent stuff, there's a lot more under the hood that they probably don't care about either. So they understand that that pullover, that roadside inspection is going to be time well spent for them. So if they have a choice between you and your trash versus somebody like show motion um, or say Garrett, Garrett has really good looking trucks. It's a lot of them out there that look great. If you have that decision, they're not going to pull Garrett or show motion. They're going to go where their time's best spent. Hmm. So get your truck cleaned up this week. Yeah, that's a, that's a good first. <laughs> that's uh, first step. It's Maybe. a good first step. It really is. Yeah. That's great. So go ahead, Rob. So just go on in a little bit. It, it, can can you just break down what the different levels are of a of a DOT? Like if you get pulled over and, you know, it's a level one or level two or level three, can you just give us a real basic synopsis of what those different levels are and what you can anticipate? So if, if the DOT officer says you're going to be receiving a level two inspection today um, at those different levels, what should uh, a driver anticipate? Well, primarily they're going to go into four different. I mean, it you've got more than four, but generally it's going to be a level one, which they do more of those than than anything else. But level two is just reviewing operating credentials and requirements, vehicle inspections, but the vehicle inspection is more moderate. And then you can get all the way down to basically a three or four and three is primarily credentials. So you get pulled over, hey, let me see your ELD or your hours of service. And sometimes that's where, you know, the tragedy can start with these things because when they check your credentials, it's important to train your drivers and ensure that they can articulate how they operate. If you get pulled over and they ask you for documentation or hours of service or ELD, if you simply, if you're operating under short haul and you just say, Hey, I don't have an ELD or, Hey, I don't have a logbook." There's more to that. There's, Hey, I don't have this because I operate under short haul. So not articulating that one piece at the end and telling them why you don't have these things can save you a world of trouble. But if you don't, if you don't articulate it, they're probably going to dig a little bit deeper and then you might end up with a level one instead of just a level three where they were going to just pull you over, check your documents and let you go along your way. So a level one obviously is the, the most in, intensive piece. And that's the one nobody wants because that's when we're getting scales out. We're crawling under, you know, with the creeper, we're checking your brakes of all things. And you typically, you can almost guarantee with a level one, they're going to find something. 
Um, I've seen trucks that were in perfect show motion condition for lack of a better word. And they couldn't find anything through the whole level one. And at the end of it, they found some corroded battery cables in the battery box and they got a violation for that. But that's really good. I mean, you pull a whole truck apart and that's all you find. That's exceptional. But a lot of times you're going to find brakes out of adjustment or other things that are common, you know, crack leaf springs and uh, things like that. So those are big ones. Uh, hours of service violations are big ones. They were big ones last year. Um, I typically try to break these down into two different aspects. So a lot of times you can look at a trucking company's SMS violations and say, hey, based on these violations or based on the condition of the truck in this roadside, this company has a systemic maintenance issue. That's something that the driver can't see when they're doing this inspection, you know, pre-trip, post-trip inspection. But their maintenance department isn't keeping the vehicles up properly. These are deep issues. Then you have this driver focused piece where it's not systemic. Maintenance is doing their job, but drivers aren't inspecting the vehicles every day the way they're supposed to be. And they're not doing DVIR. So that's a that's a big piece of it for me. You know, when I go out and I look at it from a risk standpoint or insurance standpoint or however you want to look at it from compliance piece, it's you have to eliminate the disconnect between the driver that's doing this pre-trip, post-trip, that's got visibility of this vehicle every day, that disconnect that can exist to fleet man uh, fleet maintenance management or man operations management, you know, these people aren't looking at this vehicle every day. So that visibility every day by the driver, it's important to push that by DVIR to management so people know what they need to fix. So if you don't have a good pre-trip, post-trip inspection process and program, you don't have a good maintenance program, period. So at the at the end of the day, this road check could end up pretty rough for you. So just speaking to the small truck and tr trucking companies that are going to get prepped for uh, DOT safety week or international uh, road check, road check um, the ones that are trying to get prepared for that. And they're saying, man, we really don't have a great pre-trip or post-trip plan in place. They're, they're looking at this week as, man, it, are we, we're, we're even thinking about just shutting down our trucks this <laughs> week. We, we may not even run our trucks. Right. So let's talk, let's talk about that company and what, what are some steps that they could take Right away, starting on, they listen to this podcast on Monday or Tuesday. What's some steps they can take right, take right away by, by the next Monday or Tuesday? They may have some things in place to make sure that, hey, at least we know we're on a path of doing some pre-trip and post-trip inspections. I mean, the, the first thing you can do is make it look good, right? We go back to preventability. Make it look good. People think, hey, that's not maintenance related. You're right. But people see that truck and they decide, hey, he looks good. Let's pull him over. Or your tires are bald. Hey, let's pull him over. Things that are visual, start working on those things. So if you have lights out, check those. Do a really good pre-trip, walk around, engine compartment. Um, start obviously with the walk around and make sure that everything works that is visible. So you don't have holes in your exhaust pipes. Your lights work. Your tires aren't bald. You know, you've got 430 seconds and 230 seconds where they need to be. Uh, your your fuel tank isn't held on with a ratchet strap. Um, it's things like that, you know, and Pigtails are a big one. Pigtails are a dead giveaway a lot of times. People let them hang on the, on the catwalk on the back of the tractor. And as you drive by, they see that and it's like, hey, I got one. So when they pull it over, they get you for that. Then we move on to other things. Let's pop the hood. Let's check the brakes. So really, I start with one, keep it clean, wash it, <laughs> make sure that the visible, visible defects are fixed and not visible anymore. But then two, start moving to your other common violations like the pigtail thing you know and then tie um tires obviously brakes check the adjustment um move on from there leaks are another big one got it what's a pigtail i don't even know so uh, on the back you've got your airlines and you got your electric pigtail so a lot of times when they're when they're hooked from the tractor to the trailer um some of them have some of them basically are suspended by a rod that comes off the back catwalk to keep them from hanging and dragging and but what happens is, is sometimes that, that hook will break and you, they end up dropping on the catwalk. They drag, they get holes in them. Airlines bust. Uh, I've seen them where the whole box is ripped out of the trailer and the whole unit is just hanging. So that's one of the things that they look for. So. Got it. Okay, cool. Trucker. It's kind of like that truck lingo. It's I like, appreciate oh. the honesty there. And yeah, no, be, no, explain no. To our listeners what a. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it, it's one of those <laughs> things. <laughs> But a fixture braking system is the biggest, I think that's the biggest way they look at it because once it gets a hole in the airline to the trailer, 
depending on what airline you've rubbed a hole in because you've let it drag for 900 miles, you're, you could end up losing your, your trailer brakes once you lose air to the trailer. So that's one of the reasons why they focus on that. And Yeah, I think is, is, is a challenge for small trucking companies is you see that, oh, well, I, I know that this may not be perfect or this may not be perfect. And so you start to just think, well, what, what hope do we have if we get pulled over anyway? And, and I think you can look at it like he brings up a great point. Just make sure your setup looks good. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't let them open a can of worms. If, if you've already, if you've got the can and it's already open and they see a couple of worms poking out, what are they going to do? Mm -hmm. They're right. going to go in there and look for it. So it's like, I love saying it. And he's not telling, he's not telling people to do anything wrong. He's just saying, clean your, make sure the basics of your truck are in order. I mean, I'll be honest. If your pigtails aren't even attached to your trailer, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are you even on the road? Right. And, and so that, that's, that, that's going to be those little signals. Yeah. That low hanging fruit. That's, that's clearly visible no matter where you are, no matter how far you are from that DOT guy, when you roll past him, he's going to see it and he's going to be right behind you, pulling you over. And then you're going to be sweating for the next hour. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's just start with the low hanging fruit and then make sure that if you do get that roadside inspection, courtesy, uh, courtesy goes a long way. So there's a video out there that I've placed on LinkedIn from like 1992 where, you know, the guy gets pulled over and he just blasts the cop. I mean, he cusses him for like 30 minutes and the cop just gives him his ticket and moves on. It's not 1992 anymore. So the more courteous, courteous you can be to that officer, polite, respectful, you know, that's one of the big things, you know, when I managed enterprise carriers that I put in my training is the very first thing, this can be an easy roadside or you could make it as hard as it has to be. And a lot of it starts with that respect, courtesy. Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yeah. Little yeah. things matter. A little, su little Southern hospitality can go a long way. <laughs> it uh, can. Rob, one thing that you mentioned was like, you know, the fleet maintenance, the, the maintenance department maybe, and then the driver. And yeah. so, you know, there's a, there's a dance there between those two and that relationship sounds like it's got to be pretty strong for, to ensure that, Hey, everything's getting taken care of. So could you talk to that uh, piece a little bit of, because I could imagine that there might be scenarios where the driver's like, man, these maintenance guys, I can't trust them to do anything. I mm. tell them and I, and, and it doesn't happen and it's really their fault. And then the maintenance guy goes, man, driver, Joe Bob, you know, I always tell him, but he, he doesn't, he never does anything. If he would just do his thing pre-trip, post-trip, we wouldn't have any of these issues. So like, yeah. have you, have you heard that uh, contention happen? It happens. It happens. I mean, it, it, that, I mean, it can go all the way back to qualifying mechanics and drivers. I mean, you want people that are friendly and that can work together, right. As a team, but you're not always going to get that. So I've lived with the drivers hating the mechanics and the mechanics hating the drivers and, you know, just everybody hating everybody. But at the end of the day, if we were in a perfect world, theoretically, the communication from that driver that has that daily visibility of what the condition of the truck is, is what should drive maintenance to do whatever repair they're doing minus preventive maintenance. So, if you don't if you don't have that connection between those two departments where they're functioning you know optimally there's going to be an issue with your maintenance program and that could be both systemic but it's ultimately going to start with that driver's visibility his inspection and his dvr which ultimately is that communication to the maintenance department that says hey i got a right front light out hey my right front tire is bald hey my pigtail's got a hole in it you know whatever the case is that's supposed to be the communication to your maintenance team that says hey Red light, we got to fix this. Um, and then somewhere in that process, someone has to review it and fix it. And that's kind of where I go to when I'm diagnosing like root cause of maintenance department failure. And a lot of times it doesn't even go to maintenance, maintenance department. Sometimes it is that systemic maintenance department failure, but a lot of times it's not. A lot of times it's failure to train drivers in how to do pre-trips or failure to articulate that you expect them to do pre-trips at this company because even as a driver, when I worked for the trash company, I never heard the word pre-trip. Nobody even knew what a pre-trip was. I mean, we had to do it to get our CDL, but nobody required us to do it at this company. So one of the keys is making sure that you're articulating when you bring these drivers on, hey, you got to do pre-trips here. You might not have done them at, you know, whatever waste company, but you're going to do them here. And we rely on you to do that to keep our, our vehicle maintenance systemically compliant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, so we had this issue at PDQ whenever we, we were running our trucks and 
uh, one of the things that we, we started to look at was our safety scores weren't great. And we were saying, okay, well, how, how do we turn our safety scores from bad to one of the best in the area? And so we put up all the safety scores of all the local trucking companies. We said, here's where we're at and here's where we fall. What do we got to do to be number one in our area? And, and, and we made that a goal in, in our company. It was from everybody from accounting to dispatch to the shop to the drivers. And we all worked together. And, and we did something that um, I don't know if many companies do. We were paying out and, and, and I've heard of drivers getting paid for a clean inspection, a bonus, but we were actually paying out a $50 bonus to each one of our mechanics, as well as the driver every time that a clean inspection happened. And so a funny thing would, what started happening was a truck driver would bring a truck back from a job. Let's say he went to Ohio and he got back five, six days later, he brings the truck in on Monday. He's going to go home, take a, you know, do his reset. Well, I, one of our mechanics would say, go ahead and pull it into the water bay. We're going to get a power washer. He was ready to get out there and just run the truck off and get it ready for the next time it went back out. And that wasn't something that we had to management or say, well, this is what needs to happen. He just started doing that because he wanted a clean truck out there because he knew every time a truck driver got pulled over and got a clean inspection, he got 50 bucks too. And it was a funny thing. Whenever you start encouraging that type of behavior, drivers are actually really good at knowing how to get pulled over or the specific stations to go through on how to get those inspections. But it really started changing the whole culture of our safety. So instead of just being sloppy and unattended and me like sitting there thinking I need to hide out in the bushes and say, hey, I wonder if they're doing their <laughs> pre-trip or post-trip inspection, you know, and getting there at early watching to see. Hey, there's so many different ways you can check. The best thing you can do is build a culture around it so you just have a peace of mind that it gets done. I yeah. think that, that and, and it's hard to build that, but it is possible. But I think you have to make it a collection. So as, as, as these drivers get pulled over, it has to be the responsibility of the mechanics and the driver. It just can't be, well, that driver, he didn't do it again. And Rob brings up a great point, the DVIR. We would have drivers say, well, they, they didn't work on it in the shop. And I'd say, well, where's your DVIR? Well, man, if I fill one of those out, they're not going to do it anyway. Well, no, no, that's not what I asked you. Where is your DVR? Because that's how that's that account. That's that accountability that we have with the shop to know that you reported that this light was out or that this wouldn't work. And we don't work off a of word of mouth here. We work off of paperwork. And yep. if you're not going to turn in your DVR, we don't have a way to do this. Now, this is back when it was paper logs. Now it's electronic. And I think now it's like you can have it automatically send the email to the, uh, you know, if, off the, of the DVR will automatically go to your mechanics if you want it to. So there's just a lot of really there's some things you can do right there, but you have to bring the culture of everybody invested in safety. It's not just the driver's fault. And I think that's where a lot of small trucking companies get it wrong is that they just want to blame the driver, but it, it, it starts with management. It starts with the dispatchers encouraging. Did you do your pre-trip? It's just as simple as asking, are you going to be on time? Did you do your pre-trip this morning? Did you do your post-trip? You feeling good? You having a good day? Things going well It all. It's a culture and, and it, it has to all work together. It just can't be on the backs of the drivers. And if they get pulled over, it's all their fault. They're already busting their butt. Offer them that encouragement and have the mechanic staff that's going to be able to give them the backing that they need to have the best equipment on the road. Yeah. And it's really going to start at the top. You've got the buy in. And then once you get that buy in, you've got to give that expectation out to your employees, your staff, your operations managers, your mechanics, your drivers. Everybody needs to know that you as the boss, this you're buying into this compliance mindset and that this is your expectations that if you want to work here and be successful in this company, this is the, this is the culture change that we're having. And once you push that expectation out, there has to be some, obviously some performance evaluations and then accountability. And that's kind of how you have to drive it. And without all those things, it's not really going to function the way that you want it to. So. Yeah. It, it make it, it's a team sport. Yeah. At the end of the day. 100%. You know, it, it, nobody on an island, nobody on an island. However, let me let, let me pitch this to you, Rob. Uh, it just kind of made me think, you know, most trucking companies are one six trucks. Yep. And so not everybody's going to have the, you know, the greatest, you know, fleet maintenance, you know, guy that's ready to go. You know, it, it's it's hard to get all these pieces together. It's kind of like, well, what do I do if I don't, you know, have, you know, my I, I don't have a, a, a great shop to go to, you know? So like for that one truck driver or that two truck driver, what would you recommend to them if they're like, well, uh, e easy for you to say with the team, I don't have a team. It's me. You know what yeah. I mean? So like, like, how do you, how do you kind of, uh, third party that the best way, uh, possible? So for me, like that's, that's how I started. I was the one, when I first like left management, left broker and left management, got my own trucking company and my own authority. And, um, you know, how that started was I was my own driver. I was just one guy 
with a Peterbilt driving all over the place. And I didn't have a maintenance guy. I didn't have a maintenance team. So generally how I did it, and this is not how most people that are owner operators do it, but basically I tried to find networks or vendors who had broad networks across all, the whole country. So obviously we don't want to go to loves and TA all the time. I mean, for like the emergency repair, that's probably okay. But when you need heavy work done, you want to have people that you can rely on. So I had home base, heavy duty mechanics like Cummins here in Norfolk, um, some diesel shops that I knew in places that I frequented. So like Houston, uh, Chicago, uh, San Francisco. And I ha- kind of had built this network of vendors that I could rely on. And then I continued to build that network and I didn't just pick everybody, you know, I didn't pick, you know, Huck Finn and his, you know, doorless garage. You know, I, I, you want to make sure that you're screening these vendors the right way. Um, because, As mechanics, well, as a carrier, you have to have qualifications on your mechanics, for instance, that are doing brake and inspection work. So DOT is telling you, you have to qualify these people. And that's not exclusive to your mechanics. You have to be using vendors that are qualified to do the work that you're asking them to do. So vendor screening goes a long way. I talk about it with telematics and everything else. Get some trial units and try it. Or in this case, search around, look at reviews. If the guy's got two reviews and they're both one star, don't go to that guy. So it's a lot of things you can do to do, you know, vendor screening and vendor selection, picking the right people to work on your equipment. Yeah, that's great. I like that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really hard to trust when you're, when you're getting started, it it is hard to trust mechanics. And I, and I mean that in the best way, but you, you, you always feel like you're, you're just getting, you know, sold on something that, you know, you really don't need, or do I really know? And so I think it's important. You have to build that relationship with somebody that you can trust uh, in the long run. It, it's going to work out better for you if you are going to third party shops and it, it does pay not to always go for the cheapest price, because if you always just go for the cheapest price in your area, instead of just building a relationship with somebody and letting them bill you, sometimes it, it, you're going to pay for it in the long run. That's it. All right. So, um, Rob, this has been great so far. Like this is this is excellent. I think this is a great primer for everybody. Um, uh, we want to we want to shoot them through some uh, some quick questions. See yeah, they they, they uh, see what we can come up with. Yeah, I think it's good because this will give you a good idea of uh, some things that you can do to prepare yourself for the international road check, which is May sixteenth through eighteenth. So heads up on that as you get ready, uh, Aaron. You mean to kick us off? Yeah, go ahead, dude. All right. So first one I have here. For you, Rob, it says, what are the most common mechanical violations that are cited during a DOT safety check and how can I avoid them? Brakes, uh, lights, um, and uh, tires and load securement, I think was last year's. So this year's emphasis is load securement. So your flatbedders, you know, make sure that I mean, there's regulations on how much load the the straps or chains you're using is supposed to be for whatever load you have, and you want to make sure that it's that it's secure. I, I put a lot of rate the strap work. I know a Dooner does, um, so it's it's a uh, it's a broad it's a broad deal for road check, you know. And and brakes are tough, so brakes more are systemic. But one of the things that I like to check for brakes is a lot and i don't see a lot of people doing this actually is air brake checks so i've a lot of times i'll go to to carriers for gallagher bassett and i'll sit there at four in the morning and i'll wait for people to come to work and i'll watch how they do their pre-trip you know are they doing are they doing just hey walk around check the lights and then roll out uh i've seen those probably more frequently than anything else but then how many people actually check the air brakes in these trucks I mean, how many people are doing a tug check on their trailer? How many people are checking their buzzer? How many people are totally evacuating the system after building it up and making sure that your service and emergency brakes work right and don't have leaks? You can do all of those things yourself. It's just like, you know, we've got a mountain uh, here, uh, Sandstone Mountain in Virginia. It's like 7% grade for four miles. There's a mandatory brake check pull off where you come down that mountain. I know that mountain because I caught fire on it coming down and I got good pictures of that. I'll shoot to you guys. But you can always do these things and check these things because a lot of them are things that can tell you before you even get pulled over. Hey, I've got a leak. 
somewhere in my trailer because I can hear it coming out while I do my pre-trip. And that's an out of service. So that's something that you can check for your brakes. Obviously, walk arounds, you can check your lights. So a lot of these things can be checked back to what we said at the beginning. Do your walk around, check the apparent things, the visible things, things that people can see that don't even have to be close to you to see them. So that's that's one good way. I like it. I like it, man. Mm-hmm. I, going back to uh, hiding in the bushes. Rob's hiding in the bushes. <laughs> do, do your pre-trip like uh, Rob's hiding in the bushes at 4 a.m. That's uh, it. All right. Listen, if you've ever had to check people on inspections and make sure things are going well on your yard in the morning, you've done it. I <laughs> yeah. mean, it's it's just you, you sometimes want to see what does this operation look like if I'm not here looking at it. Mm-hmm. It's it, it. You find out some interesting things sometimes. So you, the best thing is that you don't find out anything. Yeah. 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 All right. You so, gotta uh, have some, you gotta have some familiarity with what you're looking at too. I mean, you have mm-hmm. to know what a pre-trip is. You can't just sit there at four in the morning and say, Hey, are they doing this right? I mean, there's gotta be some fam- familiarity with what a pre-trip actually is and what you're looking for. Um, uh, because if you don't have that, you I mean, you don't know what you're looking for and you don't know if they're doing it right. Yeah, don't send me. <laughs> don't send me. I'll be like, yeah, you walk around it. Uh, so I'm walking around the trailer. I think you knocked on yeah. the trailer. I don't know and why. there's other dead giveaways. You know, when you get pulled over, I mean, there's a driver qualification to this piece too. But when they ask you for your hours of service, if you are an hours of service driver, you're not short haul or agriculturally exempt or whatever. If they're looking at your ELD or your grid log and they see it and they say, well, wait a minute, you didn't, I don't see it on duty time when you started the shift today. Did you do a pre trip? Well, yeah. Well, that's a false log violation theoretically because you you're showing us you drove the whole time, but there you, you actually are telling me now that you did a pre-trip the first 15 or 30 minutes, mm-hmm. but you just didn't annotate it on the log. So were you driving or not? So there's other things that kind of red flag you, you know, besides just the visibility of the truck paperwork wise. So that's a whole different animal. It's got nothing to do with maintenance. It's got everything to do with, you know, did your company hire a qualified driver one to drive the truck that they should be driving medical qualifications, Etc. So, man, I like that. That gets into the kind of that DOT officer mindset too, because they'll play those different, you know, kind of question answer games with you yeah. just to see how how they can trip mm-hmm. you up, and then right. that just adds a little extra uh, heat to you. Um, yeah. Here's the second question: What should I do if I discover a mechanical issue during a pre-trip inspection, and can I? How can I ensure that the issue is resolved before the DOT? safety check so i know that's kind of a broad question but yeah how should i just what should i do if i discover a mechanical issue i think sometimes you can be like well i might i I think there might be an issue so i'm just gonna not check because i got this uh delivery that i gotta make so you know what i mean like like so how do you how do you like what what is that best case you know what 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 are some best practices for that so you gotta the the process of this whole deal is you do your pre-trip inspection you annotate it on your log and on duty time and then you have to make a decision. Did I find defects that affect the safe operation of the vehicle, whether it's by what used to be Appendix G, it's not that anymore, but or out of service criteria is probably the most predominant one. If it's an out of service defect, you're supposed to notify dispatch. You can't take this until it gets repaired. Um, From there, that's when your DVR gets put in and it goes to the mechanic. And you're not supposed to drive that vehicle and they're not supposed to dispatch it again until those have been repaired. There's a second signature on that DVR of the mechanic that says, Hey, we fixed it. This is the work we did. And there's a work order that lines up to show that that was done and it was done right. And then you've got the third DVR, which is going to be your signature. uh, The third signature on the DVR that's going to confirm, Hey, I've received the vehicle back from the mechanic. I agree. He did the work and it's safe to operate. That's theoretically the process. So if you find that out of service defect, you have to stop it. You you can't just drive. You shouldn't. You can, but there's there's a whole different world of exposure once you drive a truck that you know is unsafe to drive. And once you drive that truck that you know is unsafe to drive, you wreck, you kill that family or you run into that bicyclist, even if it wasn't your fault, they're going to make it your fault. You knew it shouldn't have been driven to begin with. Maybe if you'd have fixed those brakes, you'd have had enough stop and power not to hit the cyclist or the pedestrian mm-hmm. or the family. And that's where it goes back to the exposure piece and how compliance affects that that exposure and nuclear verdicts and all that good stuff. It plays a big role. 
Next one here is, are there any particular items that are frequently overlooked during a pre-trip inspection? And how can I make sure that am I, that I am addressing these particular items? Brakes are the big one. Like there's a huge amount of people that for whatever reason, just choose not to check brakes. Even, even let's just say Sandstone Mountain. There's a lot of people. Sometimes there's state troopers that'll sit there at that brake check before you go down the mountain and they'll wait for trucks to pass it and not stop because they expect you not to check your brakes. And that's why brakes and brake, uh, brake parts are two of the most frequent violations that drivers get because a lot of drivers just do not check brakes. One, they're not easy to check. It's not as simple as looking at a light. It requires some effort, um, some manual effort. Sometimes you're going to get dirty. Um, but even just checking the air brake system, that doesn't require you to do any climbing under the truck um, or measuring anything. Um, doesn't require another person. It's just you. So that's a that's a huge one. Probably brakes is the biggest one. Um, I'd say the most ignored one, once you find out about it, is lights and tires. Oh, I can make it another 900 miles to get to here and I'll drop the load and then I'll get that tire changed. But, you know, if you if you take off with that tire and you know it's one thirty seconds of an inch, which means it's like a racing flat. Um, and you you again, you, you wreck and kill somebody. The first thing they're going to say is this tire didn't, didn't get bald today so um lights it's a lot of them people miss hmm. excellent here's the next one what are the most common paperwork violations that are cited during a dot safety check and how can i ensure that i have all the necessary documentation in order so falsification of logs um not having an eld not having paperwork to to uh, or user manuals for elds is a big one so one of the things that I always go back to is what we started with. Make sure that your driver can articulate how they operate, because if they don't have an ELD or a grid log, hey, I operate under agricultural exemption or short haul exemption or what other exemption you, you operate under, articulate that and explain why you don't have those things. Um, because a lot of times they'll write a violation based on what they've, they've discovered. And if you didn't articulate it right, and then later you say, well, why'd you give me a violation? I don't have these things because I'm on short haul. And it's like, well, why didn't you tell me that before I wrote the violation? So um, there's those things from hours of service perspective, but there's a lot of other paperwork that goes into these things. When you're talking driver qualifications, making sure you have your med card, obviously drivers, CDL drivers have to self-certify with their DMV, which means that they have to declare how they operate. Are they exempt from med requirements? Are they not exempt? Are they interstate or interstate? And that's one way that you know, DMVs collect your med card to verify that information. Every time you get a new one, you have to provide it or they'll cancel your license. They'll cancel your CDL. But at the roadside, a lot of state troopers or, or enforcement personnel, they want to see that you're carrying that med card like live on your person. Um, making sure that when, you, when you're driving, you're not driving something you shouldn't be. So one of the things that I frequently see when I'm doing mock audits is You'll see it. You'll have manual manual restrictions. So manual transmission restriction that's listed on the on the system that they're looking at. But he's driving a manual 13 speed. That's a disqualified driver. So there's all different kinds of things that they're going to look at. You just want to make sure that you're qualified to drive what you're driving. You've got all the endorsements you're supposed to have. Your carrier should already be checking these things. Make sure you have your med card uh, and make sure make sure you can articulate how you operate. Mm hmm. Excellent. All right. Well, next question I have is, let's say you're, uh, let's say you just, you stayed the night in Memphis, Tennessee, and you've got a load that's delivering in, uh, we'll say Cincinnati, Ohio. So you stayed in Memphis and you got a load del delivering in Cincinnati, Ohio, but you didn't realize until you were north of Nashville that you had left your wallet at the truck stop at the night before. So you don't have your driver's license or your medical card. And so what should I do if I'm unable to provide a required document during a DOT safety check, such as a medical card or my hours of service logbook? That's a tough one. Um, you're going to have one. It goes back to our, how are you going to articulate this to this guy? And I mean, most of the time, if you explain it, it's going to, well, it's going to be helpful if you can explain it the right way. But ultimately you're still going to get a violation because you can't operate without any of those things. Even if, even if it was an innocent mistake and you forgot these items back there, he has no way to identify you. He has no idea how to tell if you're telling the truth. 
you know, he can take your social or your driver's license number if you can recall it. And a lot of truck drivers can't. Uh, and he can pull you up in the system, but that's really not going to help you from a violation standpoint. He's going to give you the violation. Um, now, whether he'll put you out of service or not, I guess ultimately it's going to be up to him. But how you're going to get your stuff back, you'd have to figure that one out on your own. <laughs> I like that. Well, what he's trying to say is don't forget your wallet in Memphis. <laughs> well, every time, you know, I've got a wallet that's like this thick and uh, my, <laughs> my back surgeon gets on me all the time. He's like, stop putting that thing in your pocket. It's killing your back. And so I can always tell if it's there. You know, when I sit down, I'm like, oh, is it there? And, um, you know, it's a pain. If you lose that thing, you don't get it back. You know, the, I've done it before. And, you know, if you don't have like a passport or something in a lockbox that can get you all your stuff back, you're, you're going to be in bad shape. Yeah, we actually I have a story whenever we were this was back 2013, but we had a driver named Chuck who lived only about four or five minutes from our yard. Well, Chuck had a loaded trailer already and he lived in an RV park that wasn't far from the office. So the road he was going out on was by the RV park. Well, Chuck forgot his log. This is whenever it was paper log books. And so he pulls off of the yard. He gets about a half mile down the road and he gets pulled over by DOT. So uh, state of Texas pulls him over. They just told him that he, he actually ended up coming back to our yard where they did an inspection on his truck. At that point, they realized he didn't have his log book on him and he knew it too. He was going to stop by his house on the way out and pick up his log book. It was only four minutes from the office. Well, Chuck got put out of service. Um, that day and we had wait that load off the yard it was really kind of an aggravating experience we weren't real happy with the dot officer but ultimately it was the responsibility of the driver to have his have his paperwork on him and and yeah. that's where we had to keep it because we couldn't although we we thought it was like man can he just go get this real quick like you're here like you see the situation but this guy wasn't budging you know sometimes some folks that'll work with you sometimes they won't um, this guy was just being hard headed and, and it was what it was. You have to be prepared for the situations. Ultimately, it wasn't that, that it wasn't that trooper's fault. It was our driver's fault for, for leaving that. So trip planning things, goes a long way. That's right. Great, great, uh, great, uh, uh segue to this question, uh, Michael, how can I stay organized and ensure that I am fully <laughs> prepared for the DOT safety check, including making sure that all my paperwork is in order. What's the best way to organize all that stuff? So I, I'm a, I'm a hazmat guy. I still got my hazmat endorsement and you're supposed to keep your paperwork organized, neat in the door of the truck. And that's where I've always kept my stuff. So obviously I've got my wallet with it, which has my personal driver's license and stuff like that, Twit card and things like that. But in the door, generally I keep my med card. I keep the registration. Um, if the, any of the other things that they're going to ask for, and it's nice, neat when he asks for it, I can give it to him immediately. It's not, Hey, let me search through this and last year's paperwork and five years ago, paperwork that's still kind of all I've seen it. So the other thing with that is having the right paperwork. So, you know, we've done mock audits at, at companies and we've gone and pulled the IFTA and the registration and the paperwork for the truck doesn't match the truck and it doesn't neither one of those match the the license plate so whoever put all this stuff together has got the wrong plate on the wrong truck and the registration is wrong for both of them so it's just a mess and when when enforcement personnel find this and they realize how disorganized you are it's just going to intrigue them more to find out hey if, if something this simple is this disorganized what else do we got going on? Let's pull the let's pull the uh, pull the float out and get underneath this truck and see what else we can find. So it's it it opens the door all the way, and it kind of goes back to the courtesy thing. That first interaction, that first impression, can sometimes make or break you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it it goes back to like for one, don't have like the mailbox numbers. It's your DOT numbers on the side of your truck. Yeah, um, but then also as as like he's bringing that up. So we used to have a binder in the side of our door and it, it's a, like a little three, $4 black binder from Walmart, not expensive. And then we had the little clear plastic sheets. So, yep. you know, we would have on the front cover of it, we would slide in there a picture of our logo and it would say BR, whatever our truck numbers were. So for example, 1001. So it'd say BR 1001 and have a picture of our logo on it. You open it up and then in there clean was the sheets. It had 
we had the registration and insurance for everything, all of our trailers, and then the specific truck, you had all your paperwork, if then everything. So, and they were universal in all the trucks. So we, we knew we had those and we did an audit on those uh, multiple times a year. Our insurance renewal was like in July or June or July or something. So we'd always do an audit at that time because you had to get all the old insurance certificates out and put the new ones in. Rob's exactly right. Don't leave the old stuff in there. They don't want to have to go through that. So take that stuff out, put your new insurance cards in, all your new paperwork. And then from there, you should have a nice clean binder and you don't have to work the drivers. There's some driver responsibility there, but that goes back to the culture. Like, right. Is there someone in your business too, that's making sure that, Hey, these things are updated. So whenever the person who does insurance renewals, is it also their responsibility to make sure the cards get, get to the drivers or do they just simply insurance renew it and then just print it off and say, put this in your binder. Yeah. So I think there's a, there's a responsibility there. I think a lot of times they, they expect the driver to do everything in the business. And when it comes to administrative stuff, being able to keep these binders straight and stuff, I also think there's a there's a company's responsibility there. It's not just the driver saying, you know, bringing it up, you know, for the fourth time to tell y'all I've got old insurance cards in here. I don't know what to do with them. That's not really their job. Be sure you're preparing your drivers and put to so they have their best foot forward when they're outside on the road. And if you're a driver, your company's not doing that. Get them to say I need something better than this. You're not preparing me so whenever I get pulled over on the road, I can put my best foot forward. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of it goes to to admin management. You know, you got to have good admin personnel to do these types of things and make sure everything's on point. Well, last question is, are there any particular habits or practices that I should adopt to ensure that I'm always in compliance with DOD regulations and requirements? I don't know that it's a, I don't know that I would say it's a habit, any habits or habitual actions that I take. I mean, Generally, I want to make sure that obviously I have everything in order. And I, when I get in my truck, you know, or when I got in my truck, I would make sure to check my paperwork, one, to make sure that I've got it. Is my, do I have my med card? Do I have my driver's license? Am I prepared for this trip? Do I feel that fat wallet back there, you know, jacking my spine up? You know, all of these, all these types of things and uh, checking your fuel and doing your pre-trip. You know, there's that habit. That that's the kind of stuff is habitual and it should be every time you get in the truck. But, um, other than that, I think if you generally follow those things and you're checking your equipment and you're checking that to make sure that you have your qualification documents and everything's in order before you go. I mean, that's the best you can do outside of taking off and and just having good situational awareness and paying attention while you're driving. That's a completely different animal. So it's like habit wise, it, I think it's all going to start when you're getting in that truck and making sure everything's right. It's safe to drive. You're qualified. That's your that's your habits, really. I like to think of a, a truck driver should always think of themselves more as a pilot, right? Yeah. What do you do as a pilot? You get in there, check, 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 check. You know, I had yeah. a pilot one time tell me, he said, it was like, you know, is it safe to fly? And he said, listen, my life is a lot more important to me than yours. <laughs> so um, it's kind of a rude way to say it, but he was uh, more concerned with landing that plane and getting himself home than he was even us. So, yeah. um, but it, it, it's just, it, it just goes through look at yourself as a professional. If you're a driver, that's what I used to just tell the drivers. I'd encourage, listen, you're the professional here. Like do your job to a professional level. Don't just take, don't take this job lightly. Do it to the best possible, like the, to the best possible level that you can all aspects of it. Not just, you're not just driving and picking up something. There's people around you. There's a lot of different things going on. There's a lot of aspects to this job that make you a successful edit. Do it to a hundred percent every single time. And if you don't know how to do it to hundred percent, now that's my responsibility to figure out how, to teach you or what, what you need to be able to do to learn to get there. Yeah. Hiring, hiring the right people that are professional, that haven't sent, you know, that show initiative and, and are really trying to do the right thing the right way. That goes a long way for you as a carrier to make sure that you're hiring those types of people. But mm -hmm. second, say they're borderline, I mean, you still have to train them in your policies and procedures and what you expect. And you have to be articulating that in a way that they understand it. So then there's the follow through. So, You've got the qualification, the training, performance assessments, and, and accountability. And that's kind of how it has to flow or nothing's going to work right. Mm -hmm. Man, Rob, this is a this is a, a master class, I feel, like of, uh, of DOT <laughs> compliance. I feel like, uh, man, I'm, I'm ready to do a pre-trip, man. Like, All right. <laughs> put me to the test. Yeah, uh, that's, that's what we need, to, we need to do. We want to do a pre-trip on one of these one day. Just walk everybody through a real pre-trip. I man, mean, it takes forever. I know our next trip. There we go. So maybe for the Paul, the the fall mm -hmm. uh, international road check, I got that sounds like a good idea, Rob. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I like that. So uh, Rob, 
any uh, parting thoughts before we we close up today? My biggest things are making make sure you're qualified. Make sure you got all the documentation to show you're qualified. Your truck's clean. It looks good. And everything that's visible works on it. And everything that's not visible works on it. But especially the things that people can see. So you're not drawing attention to yourself to get that. Try to avoid that roadside inspection if you can. Preventability is a lot easier than survivability sometimes. Love it. Cool. Man, Rob, thank you so much once again. Um, everyone, connect with uh, Rob on LinkedIn, Rob Carpenter. And then we've got carpentercompliance.com. You can visit uh, uh, him if you're in the Virginia area. I'm sure he'd be happy to help you out. So, uh, Rob, thanks again. We really appreciate you. I'm sure we'll have you back uh, here. Thanks for seeing this show through with us. Show 200, thanks. that's a wrap. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>